Hey, thanks for joining us. I'm Dan Yerger on the Taking the Leap podcast. Today we had Dr. Chris McGilvray, a professor at Front Range Community College and the founder and owner of Longmont Liquors, a boutique wine and liquor store here in Longmont, Colorado. Chris tells us a lot about his interesting journey from working in big corporate box stores to launching a small independent retail space uh, and the path that took him through not only doing that while raising a newborn and having a new family, but also finishing his doctorate while literally working at the county of his liquor store. I think you'll find a lot of the insights and impressions he has about how to run a small business in America quite fascinating. Well, Chris, thanks for uh, taking the leap and being here with us today. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what your business is? Sure. Thanks, Dan, for having me. Uh, Dr. Chris McGilvray, I, um, let's see, I have over 15 years of corporate retail experience. I worked for Target for uh, 10 years, Office Depot for a couple, and um, in 2012, I started Longmont Liquors on the corner of 2nd and Main, downtown Longmont, and I've been uh, building that business ever since. Uh, about five years ago, I went um, and started teaching full-time at Front Range Community College, and so. Okay. So, I mean, really, what what started this, right? Because you've, you've got a corporate sure. background, you're, you're a doctor, not a, not a medical doctor, I'd assume. <laughs> uh, but you, you've gone and started a business, uh, of all things, kind of a liquor store. So where, where did all this start? What, what was kind of the driver behind getting this going in the first place? Well, uh, just to give you some context, I, I've always had this feeling, this, I've always had this desire to start a business. I remember when I was a little boy just driving in the back seat. My mom was driving us around, and I'd be like envisioning, someday I'm going to own a business. Obviously, I didn't know what it was. Um, and in fact, my very first date with my wife, Stephanie, um, you know, we're interviewing each other, like, what do you want to do with your life? <laughs> and I was like, you know what? I'm, I can see myself owning a business, maybe even a liquor store someday. And, um, you know, I love teaching and I didn't know at the time, but my father-in-law, Steph's a, a dad owned a liquor store. So that was <laughs> pretty, pretty interesting. But, um, I could, at a very early age, I was like, you know, I want to build something. I want to start something for my own, but I knew it was going to take a lot of time. Mm -hmm. One, because I don't come from, I don't have the background. And the, the, the best decision I ever made was when I got hired on at Target right out of college, had never worked in retail before. In fact, I stumbled into this job fair. I was like, I, I go to the left and there's a Target booth there. And I, you know, I was just like, okay, let's fill out an application, see where this goes. And um, my very first paycheck at Target, this was brilliant, I started a fictitious business account and I put $50 in it. And every single two weeks for the next 10 to 12 years, I put money into this fictitious account and you know, it obviously grew. Some, some paychecks, $5. Other paychecks, 1000 because I get a bonus. And that's really, I, I recognize like, I'm going to have to have money to start a business. And so that, that took 12 years Wow! over the years to kind of have that, have, have myself financially in a position to take the leap of faith, right? Sure. So what, what was really the mission there? I mean, you, you wanted to start a business, but what made Longmont Liquors the thing? When, and what really do you bring to that, that business as kind of the driver? Well, the driver is, is that I, I, I developed a skill set around retail. I could sure. merchandise, I can work with vendors, I had the experience. Experience matters in business. You have to know what you're doing. Sure. And I spent that time learning the business. The The liquor industry has always fascinated me um, just because nothing's recession proof, but it's something that's pretty damn close. I mean, if you tailor your business to the customer, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to build a success, successful and a sustainable um, business in my industry. Sure. And so, um, you know, I figured in 2012, what, it, what excited me about Longmont Liquors is the location for one and the low barrier of entry for two, meaning it was a shitty liquor store. <laughs> it was like tailored to the wrong customer. It was on its, it was on its la last life support. The, there was no product on the shelf and it was a dying business, which created a unique opportunity for Steph and I because... We could actually afford to get into the business. Um, previous to that, though, 
you know, I've, I've had many conversations, uh, you know, with previous liquor store owners, taking them up out to coffee and, you know, having the conversation about like, okay, so how's this experience for you? If you could do things differently, what would you do? What, what worked? What doesn't work? What would you do? What would you do, do, do differently? And it was because of those conversations that I recognized if I'm ever going to start a business in this industry, I have to go micro. I have to go small because the only thing that has leverage in my business long term is the real estate. And that was something that I recognized early on. So Steph and I knew if we're going to start a business, we have to purchase the building and that gives us long term leverage because eventually your lease is going to expire. You're going to have to renegotiate your terms on your lease agreement and through the years you're going to run smaller and smaller margins and it's going to become more and more difficult for you to sustain your business. So we knew we're not going to have this sexy business right next to a, a King Supers or this big warehouse business. One, we couldn't financially, it just wasn't feasible. We knew if we were going to quit our jobs and go all in, we were going to purchase small, but purchase the real estate at the same time. And um, that's what we decided to do in sure. 2012. Sure. So you, you were doing kind of two different things before starting your business. I mean, you, you talked about working at Target and, and Office Depot, but... Um, you also got your doctorate somewhere along the way. So what were you really doing before you launched Longmont Liquors? So let's go back to my experience at Target. Okay. So I spent 10 years at Target. I got hired on as what they called an executive team leader. And I was in charge of the sales floor. That's where I learned how to merchandise and work with vendors and such. I learned how to manage people. It's a big deal in business. Um, and so I was a field merchandiser and... So I oversaw a 10 state territory of the entertainment division of a Target, and that gave me a lot of scope. I got to fly on the corporate jet a few times. That was pretty awesome. And I learned how to tailor my message to different audiences, and that actually helps me now in business. Um, I also ran a store for Target in Salt Lake City uh, for three years. I was a general manager of a, of a Target store. So I learned Target did well at teaching me best practices in terms of merchandising, just how to manage a retail business. That's important. Now, it's a lot different than owning a business, but you do have to manage a business. That's an element of ownership. And so from there, um, I spent a couple years at Office Depot as a general manager of the Greeley store. And again, it was a little bit less formal structure than Target, so it was a good transition to go from a Target, who's a Fortune 500 company that really has proven successful business practices, to Office Depot, a little bit more micro. I had a little bit more autonomy to get creative with planograms and merchandising and hiring and staffing and developing. So from going from Target to Office Depot to Longmont Liquors was a good transition. But every year I worked for Target and Office Depot, it got harder and harder to work for other people because um, one, I made the mistake thinking that I could run things more efficiently as a business owner. You know, and I made a lot of mistakes. I didn't appreciate the value that comes with working for other people. If you work for other people, they give you a paycheck. <laughs> they pay for your health insurance. They gave me tuition reimbursement. Target paid for my master's degree while I was working for them. They paid for my doctorate degree with the exception of the dissertation. So you asked about my, you know, how did I become a doctor? Well, when I ended up leaving Target, they paid for my doctorate degree with the exception of the dissertation. And so when I went to Office Depot and then eventually I started Longmont Liquors, I pretty much dropped out of the doctorate program because who needs a doctorate degree to run a liquor store? Fair Nobody question. that I know. But two years into my business, uh, I'm going to explain the worst day of my life, Dan. I'm sitting, it's February. I'm sitting in my store. It's snowing outside. I haven't seen my family. It, I'm missing dinner with my family. It's about 7 p.m. I haven't had a customer in like an hour. And... I feel sorry for myself and I start crying because I'm just like, this is not what I signed up for. I'm working the hardest I ever have in my life, making the least amount I ever have in my life since flipping pizzas in high school. And so I'm sitting in my store and I'm like, you know what? This, my dream was to start a business. Since I was a little boy, I dreamed of starting a business. Here it's materialized, yet the world's crashing down on me and I can't figure out how to be successful as a business owner. And so I'm sitting there by myself in my store for 20, 30 minutes, just feeling sorry for myself. And in that moment, I, 
I thought, you know what? I have to flip the script and think of things that are positive. And I recognize I'm still married. My wife never made me feel guilty for working crazy hours through the business. Um, I had a lot of time on my hands. I just needed to learn to leverage my time more appropriately. Um, and I owned a laptop so I could access data. And that's what inspired me to study entrepreneurship in Longmont. And for the next year and a half, I wrote a dissertation on the counter in my liquor store where I studied the difference between what we think we need to do in business, not just to open a business, not just to celebrate our three year anniversary with nothing else to show for it except our open sign is still on, but to sustain a business versus what we actually do and looking at the difference between what we think we need to do versus what we actually need to do. And that was such a rewarding experience. And um, I learned a lot through that process. I learned that, um, that I'm very hard on myself, that I was doing things better than what I really thought. There's a lot of horrible stories out there. Businesses that on the surface look like they're crushing it. They've got all the bells and whistles, yet they're on the verge of going out of business and they can't. So it was very humbling to go through that process. And that's how I got into teaching. I started out part-time at Front Range Community College. Um, and then uh, three years ago, I went full-time. So that's my story. That's how I, I'm sticking to it. Well, and it's, it's quite a story, right? You've accomplished a huge amount in not that long amount of time. Um, I mean, again, to your point, right? How many, how many people running a liquor store can say they have their doctorate? Uh, not, not a lot, not many. <laughs> uh, but I mean, that's, that's quite the motivator. So, so just kind of getting back to the root of it for a second, where, where did the idea come from? Where did the spark come from? You, you know you always wanted to run a business. You always wanted to have a business. Um, you're working in, and you've transitioned from kind of a cookie cutter template to mm -hmm. some uh, kind of a corporate environment where you have a little mm -hmm. few more options. But what, what was the aha or where, where did you first get the idea that Longmont Liquors is going to be the thing we do? There wasn't really one aha. Um, it kind of was looking back. It's bits and pieces that when you tie it all together, it's like putting a, 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 a puzzle together. The puzzle has a lots of pieces. There's thousands of different pieces. And throughout my life, I was putting pieces together in, in small increments to position myself to even be aware of the opportunity that presented itself to me in April of 2012. For example, I needed to have money, right? I self, we self-funded our business. We didn't leverage any capital and we still haven't. You know, I have a, uh, a $10,000 open line of credit right now, and I'm terrified to, to put like a, 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 a soda on it. That's because <laughs> how I built my business has been super frugal and super slow and steady that I still to this day leverage no, nobody else's money. And it's something I'm really proud of. In fact, the more I learn about the, my business model, I'm glad I built it that way. But all these little pieces had to come together for me. You know, um, I... I did a little bit of due diligence in 2012 to find that opportunity. So it's amazing, Dan, what you can, what you can find on this device. <laughs> so I have to share this. I have people today telling me how lucky I am because I have a business right across from one of the biggest property developments, commercial developments in our city. It took me 15 minutes on this device to do my due diligence. So it's March 2012. I see this Craigslist ad for this ghetto liquor store for sale. The asking price is what I have in my savings account. So that initially was what intrigued me. So I go to the location, I walk through the, the store, see the site, I see a lot of opportunity there. Um, one, I, could, I felt that I could turn it around in terms of the merchandising without spending a lot of money. Um, but also I identified that the city of Longmont had just completed a first in Maine revitalization study basically identifying First in Maine, which was a block from my location, as being one of the number one developmental sites over their next 20 years. And I did that in 15 minutes on my phone. So that excited me about not just the business that I could produce, but also like, like going back to what I said earlier, if I were to start a business, I have to buy the real estate. Mm -hmm. And I was in a position to do both in a great location, but it, it was gonna be a long-term play for me. And that's when Steph and I, this is another thing I advise my students to think about. Number one, why do you want to start a business? Number two, make sure you have a clear idea and plan 
about how you're going to get out of your business before you go in it. A lot of people call it an exit strategy. I call it more of a sustainability strategy, um, but it's kind of the same thing. It's like, okay, what do I need to do to ensure that all that time I'm going to put into my business, I can actually have something to show for that sweat equity? And uh, it took Steph and I five years to implement ours. Sure. So, I mean, beyond just having a savings account built up, doing 15 minutes of due diligence on, uh, on your cell phone, I mean, what did you do to really take the, take the time to, pre to prepare? Or did you not? Did you just find this opportunity and jump on it immediately, put, you know, put in your notice a week later? Um, that's pretty much what I did. So I found that, it took me two weeks. I found the opportunity on Craigslist. Mentally, I was preparing myself through the years, um, but literally I found the opportunity and then two weeks later I purchased and it was a turnkey operation so I, I closed on a Sunday. I quit my job at Office Depot that Sunday and I started the business that Monday. So it was turnkey and I learned as I went. Jeez. So what, what really ended up being the biggest challenge of the transition, right? What, what really ended up being the, the greatest hurdle amongst all the hurdles that come up in starting a business? Hmm. Good question. I think, you know, looking back to 2012, it was, I didn't know what I was doing, for one. I, did, I had never started a business. I've always worked for other people. And it was, I had expectations that my sales were going to be at a certain level, which they weren't. I had expectations that my expenses were going to be at a certain level, which they weren't. Um, I, at this time, was still, uh, I had a rental property in Salt Lake City. And so at the time, I had three mortgages, essentially. I had my Salt Lake City rental, I had the lo Loveland house that I was living in, and I had the building that I had just purchased. So I had 12 years of being conditioned to being a great employee I, that has an income to now I don't have the security and the stability that comes with working for other people, yet I still have high expenses, three mortgages, those fixed expenses that aren't going to go away. And my wife was teaching at, this, at the time, and which was significant because that did bring some security for us. Um, you know, but I was making a six-figure income. So when you're walking away from that level of income and you are still trying to provide for your family at that level, that's a difficult transition. It requires you to really take a hard look at your expenses, your, everything you're doing. You have to think outside the box. In fact, it took me two months to recognize the revenue I was producing wasn't going to be enough to sustain our exit or sustainability plan. I had to think very, very creatively at how I was going to pay my property tax on the building, support the Loveland mortgage and the Salt Lake City mortgage, and I had to add a wall, cipher off our building into two separate sections, lease the back of my store to generate revenue um, to ensure that I was making all, paying all my bills and um, staying in business essentially. Essentially, Dan, the first three years, I was in survival mode. What can I do to stay in business? And it was, it was tough. Sure. I mean, I remember apologizing to Steph on more than one occasion that I put our family in this position because you know we because I didn't feel like I was delivering on the things that I should be delivering on both as a business owner for one but as a leader of my family which is the most important thing sure so what advice would you give to somebody if if you met a manager at a target somewhere today and he said hey I think I'm I'm going to go start a start a retail business like yours what would you tell that guy why First well, of all, I'd learn more about the context. Sure. For because a lot of people think it's sexy to start a business, mm -hmm. and for one thing, you know, it, this whole notion of starting a business is the next fad. Like everybody thinks it's trendy. This whole entrepreneurship theme. Everybody wants to start a business, but I'd want to figure out more about them. What are their goals? And learn more about the people that are involved in that person's life is another important component because it may be Susie Q's goal to start a liquor store, but if she's married, I would want to see if Susie Q's, what her husband's goals are and learn the whole package. And that was really critical for, for me is it was a McGilvery family decision. It wasn't just a Chris McGilvery decision. Mm -hmm. And my wife was fully on board. And if I didn't have the support of my family through the process, 
I wouldn't be married right now and I wouldn't have a business right now. Sure. Because starting a business is so damn stressful to begin with. Imagine adding added pressure and stress from your significant other or your friends and family or your, your parents in that dynamic. It really adds to the level of intensity. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing is, you know, why? Why do you want to start a business? Do you know yourself? Mm-hmm. What do you value? If you value, if, uh, if you value stability, if you value security, if you value partying downtown at Lodo on a Saturday night, <laughs> what are those values that drive you? And those values, I can pretty much tell very quickly if they align to business ownership. And, you know, if you value flexibility, if you value autonomy, if you value uh, short-term sacrifice for long-term gain, um, those are things that le- tend to lend well to business ownership. Because look, it's gonna, you're not gonna make more money when you start a business today than you would the opportunity cost of doing something else. But you have to always be thinking long-term, right? And that's why it takes a lot of thought up front and strategy up front to implement that, to ensure that the time more than anything is not going to just go to waste. You know, it's something that I'm really proud of is I have a small business. I have a lot of people giving me advice, which by the way, the best advice you can get is equally the worst advice you can get and it's free. And so you have to be very thoughtful with the advice you get. But right now I'm in a position where Steph and I, we have this sustainable micro business that we're really proud of and we can do nothing except focus on our customer moving forward and it's sustainable, right? You don't have to spend a lot of money because I didn't have a lot of money. Sure. I spent over the last eight years on average $400 a year on my advertising. So you don't, have to, you don't have to spend money to make money. I hear that a lot from businesses is, you know, you have, to, you have to spend money to make money. You don't. I'm a case study for that. You have to work really hard. You have to be strategic. You have to have clear objectives that align to your strategy. But by no means do you have to spend money. Sure. So you, you talk about kind of now being more on the full-time teaching side of the, of the business or just of, the, of your family, really. So what are you doing in the business right now? So right now, my wife manages the business during the week, and she's doing an f- amazing job. <laughs> so our kids are now in um, at a place where they're in school, so before Steph was home. So Cammie's in uh, fourth grade, Kason's in first grade, so um, Steph runs the business during the week, which is awesome, um, because now I that's what I do during the week. I teach full-time. Um, I'm still heavily involved with the ordering, so I still order the wine, the beer, the liquor. Um, I still do the QuickBooks um, because that really keeps my pulse on the operating account. And so, you know, but for the most part, it's interesting because Steph manages the business during the week and our personal finances, but I'm still involved in the business finances. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of still involved from afar, um, but definitely teaching has been rewarding. Um, My narrative changed significantly when I went full-time teaching because for five, six years I was, here's Chris McGilvray attached to a brick and mortar business, working my ass off, open to close, (laughs) you know? I love telling this story to my students, but it's true. For the first five years of my business, I took 10 days off. And that's important for my students to understand, especially if they're gonna go the brick and mortar route, right? It's different when you when you have a mobile business and you don't have that physical, tangible business that you have to have a human being operating all the time, mm-hmm. you know? So that's what, 1,480 days I took 10 days off and I can list every single one of those days. So now, uh, so that was my narrative for the first five, six years. When I went full time, it was like, okay, here I was, Chris McGilvray, business owner first that happens to serve his community and teach part time to now, Here's Chris McGilvery as a community leader who provides value for his community and is an educator. Oh, and by the way, guess what? In the background, he has a sustainable business that continues to contribute to the community as well. So how do you think that that narrative affects your kind of teaching experience, right? Most professors kind of go bachelor's, master's, doctorate. 
uh, and then go go do research and teach on the side, or they teach and they do research out of necessity. So how do you feel as somebody who came more through a in the workforce, in in the entrepreneurial space, coming back to academia. Do you feel like that gives you more credibility or do you feel like you have a steeper mountain to climb because you didn't take a more traditional track? Um, I think in, in the context of teaching, the customer is the student. I've always thought that the student is the foundation for our institution and all colleges. So with that framework in mind, I'm a practitioner teaching the things that I'm executing against every single day. It doesn't get any better than that. When I was taking business classes at UNC, Webster, CTU, it was the faculty that were actually in the field that were making things happen that have the experience. Those were, and that could lean on those experiences and pass those experiences on to the students. That's really what resonated for me. When we had uh, guest speakers come in where we had like CPAs, CFPs come into the class and share with the students, this is what's important. Do you want to build wealth for yourself and you're 18? Guess what? I'm a CFP and this, these are practical steps that you can take now as an 18 year old. That resonated with me. So I always keep that in mind about the way I felt as a student to say, you know what? I'm trying to be, provide value to my student, just like I'm trying to provide value to my customer, right? And I think one of the value propositions I have as an educator is that I have a sustainable retail Main Street business in operation as we speak. And I'm, I have yet to have somebody connect me with somebody that's teaching business right now that has a Main Street retail business that's sustainable, that also is teaching at the collegiate level. If you find somebody, connect them with me. I want to have a conversation <laughs> with them. But that's my value that I offer. Students really appreciate that. Sure. So what do you really enjoy about your business? I mean, you've gotten to take a step back, but clearly those first five years with only 10 days off, right? That's a grind. That's a heck of a grind. So really, what do you get to enjoy out of having a business now that you're kind of past that phase? Well, there's the value of community, Dan. I mean, I have a business that has employees, like, so I'm contributing to that sense. Plus, this community has been so good to me and my family that continuing to sustain my business long term think of the value that comes with that you know i'm helping people achieve their goals through my organization every time you come in and buy a bottle of wine there's sales tax attached to that that's revenue <laughs> directly going back into our community mm -hmm. i'm paying property tax on my building that gets reinvested so by having this small business on the corner of second and main that stays in business right the long term not just today where i'm like put an ad out in the newspaper to drive my sales like I'm thinking long term, the value that that contributes to my community, I'm very, very proud of. And plus I contribute a lot of my time on a number of different um, committees and boards and organizations. And um, I think my business is a pillar for my success. Really, it's, it adds to the credibility of what I try to offer to my community, mm -hmm. to my students, to my family. Sure. It's all possible because I have a sustainable business. Sure. So let me ask, what resources would you recommend someone in your position use, right? What, what things kind of make up the difference between being, you know, employee of the month every month for five years uh, and trying to get back to being more involved in your community or spending more time with your family or sure. pursuing something outside of just making the business work? So it's not like I just woke up one day and all of a sudden I was where I, 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 I am successful. I had a strategy that I communicated that Steph and I had created before we started our business. So what it did require, fully transparency, from the 30-year-old Chris McGilvray to the 35-year-old Chris McGilvray, I was not gonna be drinking beer with my buddies in the evenings. That was not gonna happen. On the flip side, unfortunately, I'm not gonna be taking my family to Disneyland during those five years. On the flip side, I know I need to replace my sign out front. It's a really old sign. My store needs a lot done to it. Unfortunately, from the 30-year-old Chris McGilvray to the 35-year-old Chris McGilvray, that's unfortunately not going to happen. I'm going to grow my businesses at a rate that the operating capital can support, but most importantly, my objective that I wanted to accomplish before I started my business was, was going to get met. That way, when I hit my five-year sustainability plan, which was completely debt-free, inventory, business, and most importantly, my building, 
all of a sudden now I have two S corporations. One S corporation pays rent to the other. Since my building's paid off, all of a sudden now that's added cash flow into the business where I can invest more into the inventory. I can take my family on a vacation. I can hire more people and I can finally phase myself out of the business. Not fully because you still need to work your business to sustain it. That's another myth that's out there is like once you break even or once you hit success, it's like, okay, let's go to Tahiti and smoke weed. Like <laughs> that's not what it's like. Like I'm still in my business working a lot, 20 hours a week, managing it, helping Steph. Um, but that's my, my, it's, it's what happened in the back end that I don't story tell a lot is the fact that when I started my business, Steph and I were already committed to our objectives up front and we knew it was not going to be sexy for five years. You know, if you drove by my store during that five years, you were going to see my car par parked outside the building. There's a hundred percent chance you're going to see my car parked outside that building from 10 AM to midnight. That's not sexy. That's not what you see on Instagram, right? But now we're in a position now that we have slight leverage and I'm getting more of my time back, which is the most valuable thing in business. And so you really want to be thoughtful about where you're putting in, how, where you're putting in your time to make sure that you're getting your return on your investment. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a big five years for our family. Sure. And now we're finally at a position where we can start to see those benefits. Sure. Well, and on, and on the positive side, what really end, ended up kind of, I'd say, may, maybe both in the first five years and since then, what have been the biggest surprises? Um, the biggest surprise, you don't know what you don't know. The biggest surprise is, for me, I could do it. I'm, I'm very insecure, you know. Um, Steph will tell you this all the time. I guess I'm secure being insecure, and that's what business teaches you. Um, I, it, it, all, it taught me a lot about patience. It taught me a lot about don't compare yourself to Susie Q that lives next to you or your cousin Jim or your brothers and sisters because they're on a different path than you. And so it, that's really, I gained a lot of self-awareness through starting a business. It's a very lonely path. And so it, it takes a lot of guts, a lot of patience, a lot of determination and commitment. Um, but what was most surprising is what I accomplished. And I'm very proud of that. And, um, you know, when I have people that I think very, very highly of that I think are hugely successful and they come to me and they recognize me for being successful, I have a hard time with that. Even today, I think I'm always going to be. Call it the uh, imposter syndrome. No. People call me a doctor and I'm like, did I fake the system? How did I get my doctorate? Oh yeah, I wrote a dissert dissertation. I studied entrepreneurship. I went to five or six dis uh, you know, um, residencies while working at Target. I did all these things. I have all the paperwork to show. Here's my transcript. I was not only a doctorate student, I spoke at the graduation. I'm an honors doctorate student, but I still don't, I have a hard time when people call me Dr. McGilvery because I'm like, I think I fooled the system. And I still have that in business when my business was recognized for small business of the year through the Longmont Chamber of Commerce. I go, really? That's our business that got recognized? So what really surprised me is, you know, I'm capable. No one's ever started a business in my family. And so I was the first to, um, you know, to prove that we could actually do it. Sure. So I, most surprises came internally for me. I can imagine. So. Still. So. so Obviously, you know, liquor stores are, are kind of a, an item of interest, right? It's different every single county, every single state, um, just about everywhere you go, at least in the United States. It's different around the world. But if you were to look maybe 30 or 40 years into the future, what do you think your business look, looks like? Uh, the industry's changing. January 1st in Colorado, they passed a law where you can purchase full-strength beer in all the retailers, the grocers. And so your Targets, your Walmarts, your Sam's, you can now go in and, and you know, buy Modelo. And it's significantly lower because of economies of scale than the smaller businesses like mine. So um, there's that element. And so that's the industry currently is going through some, some change. And it's causing a lot of um, uneasiness amongst the small business, the independent liquor store owners. 
But I think long term, there's still a place for liquor stores. There's still a place for small business brick and mortar stores. Um, you know, with Amazon running double digit comps year after year after year, six or seven years in a row, those sales come from somewhere, you know, and they're coming from the brick and mortar. Yet my rent is staying the same year after year after year until my lease expires, then it goes up. Yet my revenue is continuing to decline as a brick and mortar business owner. So there's still a place for brick and mortar to succeed. And here's how you have to be smart with your spending. You have to make smart decisions. You have to be frugal. You can't just overextend yourself. So as long so one plus one has to equal two as a brick and mortar business owner, actually across the board in business. The numbers need to add up. So if I'm a brick and mortar business owner, I have to be very smart and frugal with my money and my time. And I have to ask myself, how can I create a niche? How can I separate myself from my competition and through my business model, it's always been relationship driven. Um, I, people are gonna uh, want to do business with Chris and Steph because we're human beings. We can make that connection. We, they know us by name, we know them by name. They see Steph out in the community, so they, see, they see Chris out in the community doing good for the community through teaching, through serving on boards, through volunteering, um, and we're just good people. And that right there draws a connection with our customer. So we do have customers that may drive by our competitors where they would have saved money. They'll spend more through us, but they'll still shop with us because that's relationship based. So I still feel for, for the industry, if you can focus on relationships, if you can focus on what makes you unique, is it through your unique product selection? Is it focusing on local? Is it developing strategic alliances to introduce a unique item that nobody else has to offer? Or is if, if, if maybe it's experience based. So when you come in and there's wine tastings and there's things like that that are unique, um, I think that's gonna lend well. I don't think people are gonna stop drinking in the next 30 years, Dan. There's always <laughs> gonna be a place for wine, beer, and liquor in well, Colorado. Here's to that. <laughs> yeah, cheers. <laughs> cheers. <laughs> Uh, is there anything else you want to share with your fellow business owners? Is there anything that we don't know that we don't know or that you think that uh, the average business owner, whether they're a new owner or an experienced owner, is missing out on or not thinking about that they should be? So I would say uh, things that I've already shared, you know, business is tough, so you have to figure out why, what, are, what passions um, do you have. Um, and have goals, know what you want out of business. Um, I, I, instead of celebrating the fact that you still have your open sign on, take it a, ne a step further, you know, so that you can leave a legacy for, the, for what it takes to start a business. I have so much appreciation for the business owner because you're juggling so many different hats. And um, I would say while you're in that moment of stress and you're trying to do everything you can to keep your customer happy, retain your employees, you know, run a pro positive P&L this month. It's just like, be patient, enjoy the process, not always focus on the end destination. And so because, you know, you wanna look back and, and enjoy being a business owner. If you're not enjoying what you're doing, pivot, do something else. You know, if you hate what you're doing, pivot now. If you don't like what you're doing, analyze why. It still may be a good fit. You just need to make, maybe look at some things a little differently. Um, and for me, it's because happiness should drive everything, especially when you, like for me and Steph, Cambria is already in fourth grade. Time flies when you have children. So you really want to appreciate the, the now and what a business offers. And so you want to manage your business. You want to own a business. You don't want to fall in the trap of it owning you. And it certainly will if you let it. True. I think that's some wisdom we can all take home and hopefully make some good use out of. Dr. Yeah. Chris McGilvery, thank you for coming in. No, oh, thank you. <sighs> Taking the Leap is filmed in Longmont, Colorado. Produced by Jeff Zimmerman. Audio and visual by M3 Films. Taking the Leap is a program by My Wealth Planners, an independent fee-only registered investment advisor. Mm -hmm.